Right, I, I'm going to start the meeting formally. We are already recording it, but we can uh, edit out some of um, some of our organisational uh, issues. So, welcome everybody to this book launch. The publication of Climate Psychology, A Matter of Life and Death, represents, in my mind, a true coming of age of the discipline of climate psychology. And so you're all very welcome, whether you're attending now or whether you're watching the recording at a later time. I'd like now to pass over to Kate Pierce, representing the publishers, Phoenix Publishing House, for her right. to say a few words. Lovely. Thank you, Judith. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you all here on behalf of Phoenix Publishing House to the launch of Climate Psychology, A Matter of Life and Death by Wendy Holway, Paul Hoggett, Chris Robertson and Sally Weintrobe. We are very proud to be the publishers of this important new work that addresses a subject that affects us all, climate crisis. The unique contribution this book makes is that it focuses on our inability to face up to this crisis. The authors investigate what it means to be human in the Western world and how we can find new and unfamiliar connections to the living world. By using a transdisciplinary mix of approaches, Wendy, Paul, Chris and Sally look at the unconscious processes of the modern psyche to help us find a way to forge links between eco, psyche and social. Despite the serious nature of the subject matter, Working with Wendy, Paul, Chris and Sally has been an absolute delight. Their passion for this work shines through and with it, they have created an original and vital piece of work. I give my thanks to them for creating such a thought provoking, engaging and timely book and for entrusting it to Phoenix. They also sourced the wonderful cover image, which many will have seen as you came in. And I would like to thank the artist Yamamoto Masao for graciously agreeing to its use. I would also like to thank the endorsers, Donna Orange, Mary Jane Rust, Rupert Reed, and Bayo Akamalafi for their considered words on the book. And my thanks again to Bayo and Rupert, alongside Rebecca Weston for speaking at tonight's event and to Judith Anderson for chairing. If you haven't already ordered your copy of the book, please go to our website, firingthemind.com to purchase a copy with a 10% discount. A link will be placed in comments for people to order from. And it is of course available from all book retailers worldwide. Thank you to everyone who's joined us here today. And I shall now pass you back to Judith. Thank you, Kate. And I hope uh, we'll be publishing more books on climate psychology with you. Great, thank you. As I said, I think the publication of this book represents a coming of age of this discipline which is represented by, although not exclusively, the work of the Climate Psychology Alliance. And I want to say a little bit about that organization for those of you who don't know us. Notably, we had our first meeting over 10 years ago with speaker Clive Hamilton, whose book, Requiem for a Species, Why We Resist the Truth About Climate Change, demonstrates the key ideas we've been wrestling with for over a decade. There are many facets to the work of, of the Climate Psychology Alliance. The handbook on the website defines the field. Podcasts, again, on the website, offer conversations which many tell us they find give them solace and nourishment. There has been research into the emotional reactions of activists and scientists. And more latterly, the emotional response of children and young people all over the world. And the way that their feelings represent a very profound moral injury. We support activists and others through a pro bono program of therapeutic support and create spaces for deep listening through climate cafes, 
We provide spaces for therapists to rethink their approach in the light of this dreadful climate crisis. And then there is the work of our deep academic thinkers underpinning this work with the activism and the listening and academia in a way dancing together, each nourishing the other. And I was most struck when I talked to the authors about something Wendy said about somehow in this book, feeling into the future of many ideas. This afternoon's for, in this, this afternoon's format, you're going to hear from each of the authors with a brief introduction to their work so that you can get a sense of who they are. And then we're going to turn to our respondents, Rupert Reed, Beo Afikoma Laffey, and Rebecca Weston, to give us their impressions of the book. And then in the last 30 minutes, I don't know quite what will happen. We have a space for conversation and that will be interesting. So first of all, I'd like to ask Paul to talk about his chapter. Paul Hoggart is a psychoanalytical psychotherapist and training therapist in Bristol and an emeritus professor of social policy at the University of the West of England. And you can find out more about him if you read the book. Paul, over to you. Okay, thank you, Judith. Uh, hello, everyone. Today, we stand at a crossroads, at an interregnum where the old fossil fueled civilization is dying and the new cannot yet be born. The forces of truth, the truth of what we're doing to the planet and to each other, have been gathering for several decades. The establishment in our mind and in society with its co commitment to business as usual has held firm, even though it must know it's dying. In this standoff, a variety of morbid symptoms begin to appear. Conspiracy theories flourish, fundamentalisms of many kinds appear, and almost everywhere, strong men promise salvation. Everyday denial is based upon fear of truth. We fear that if we really open ourselves to the truth of our deepening ecological and climate emergency, we would be overwhelmed by feelings of catastrophe, terror, loss, guilt, and despair. We cannot avoid knowing about worsening climate change, but we can split off these thoughts from our feelings. This results in a special kind of knowing, one drained of meaning, so that we're left, what we're left with is a set of lifeless thoughts about climate change, thoughts which fail to trouble us. Like any defense mechanism, denial is ultimately a form of self-deception, a way in which we tell little lies to ourselves and come to believe in our own internal propaganda. But cynicism, constitutes a different relation to truth, an indifference to truth, and at its worst, a nihilistic cont contempt for truth. Cynicism is the modus operandi of the old forces who know their time is up, but refuse to go quietly into the night. Cynicism and nihilism are intimately related. The nihilist sees no meaning or value in life. The nihilist can be very clear sighted about climate change, but just doesn't give a fuck. In the context of the deepening climate emergency, a shift is occurring. Whereas fear of the truth and climate denialism lies at the heart of liberal democracy, climate nihilism starts to become prominent in the post liberal authoritarian age. An age that, if we're not careful, will be accompanied by progressive social collapse as climate change deepens. Okay, 
That's my bit. Thank you, Paul. And um, I want to say about Paul's chapter that um, many people have written about our defences, but I think the way Paul brings them together um, is a tour de force and be a resource for many years to come. I'd now like to invite Wendy to speak about her chapter. Wendy's an emeritus professor of psychology, an honorary fellow of the British Psychological Society and fellow of the Academy of Social Scientists. She co-founded the UK Psychosocial Network. So over to you, Wendy, to talk about what was going on when you wrote your chapter for you? Thank you, Judith. Um, this word psychology, which reaches back a long way, really, in, into my professional life. This is a book about climate psychology, and it's trying to look into the future, as you said, Judith. But there's an awful lot about psychology that's not fit for our purposes. Um, in the book's introduction, we say that the, the domination of the individual in modernity has been helped by the discipline of psychology. <clears throat> and so we are reaching the end of this age of modernity the arc of modernity as it's called sometimes. And this is why we are at this crucial juncture. Um, and psychology is part of what is no longer fit for purpose. The modern psychology, which is defined when I was an undergraduate as the science of the individual. <clears throat> so what's wrong with that individual then? We had to ask ourselves as a group when we were writing um, how, how we step outside of the shaping of the modern individuals that we all are um, and, and why that matters. Because surely the individual just seems like a unique person and that's a value. And why would we even raise a question about it? Um, in some day it would look as if it was like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But um, I start, I want to stay with the trouble of that idea of, of the individual and the modern individual. Um, I say in my chapter, there is a tangle of meanings in the phrase modern individual. Um, I'm talking about that idea, that concept, which became so obvious that to question it runs the risk of sounding as if I'm doubting the separate bodies that house distinct people with their unique desires and capacities. We're all unique persons in that sense. The idea of the individual, though, came to carry a larger set of meanings revolving around separation, for example, autonomy, independence, rationality. Uh, as I will say a bit more about, that's a set of characteristics which is also associated with the masculine. <clears throat> anyway, these shaped human development in the West. This was um, in modernity, this was a European project for 500 years. So that people came to inhabit some of these imperatives, albeit uneasily, very uneasily, as we shall see. Um, and there, our psychologies are shaped by that modernity. So that is um, the start of my theme. Um, and in fact, in all of our chapters, we are trying to imagine, or beginning to imagine anyway, what it might involve to be human creatures beyond the straitjacket of the modern individual. Um, but for me, I had to start historically um, documenting uh, the European separation of mankind from nature. Um, a, a, such a, a consequential separation as I think we'd all recognize now. And the positioning of women was not within 
mankind um, versus, as it were, separate from nature during this history. And I reveal how the binary positioning of mankind and nature worked closely in tandem with the gender binary, um, the opposition between the masculine and the feminine as a dichotomy. And that dichotomy, of course, imposes on real men and real women um, in uncomfortable ways, distorting ways. So my main chapter focus is what can be found beyond the gender binary. And always warning, and I do this a lot in the chapter, that to talk about masculinity um, and man should not be conflated with actual men. Um, and as I've already said, men and women do not easily inhabit the imperatives of modernity's individual or modernity's gender binary. So there's two binaries together, man versus nature or opposite to nature and man opposite to woman. And they did violence to the animistic relation to the earth that informed humans pre-modern world. Um, European armies and missionaries carried this new antagonistic, separated, we talk about it as fractured and dissociated, disassociated, this relation to the earth with them when they colonized the so-called new world. Non-white people like women were cast as other to civilized rational man. In Chris's chapter, I hope uh, he wasn't planning to mention this particularly, but anyway, he cites the non-white view of a Taos Indian whom Jung met in 1925. Um, among the other wise non-modern things that Jung was told, he um, was told whites believed they thought with their heads when everyone at the Pueblo knew thinking comes from the heart. Beyond the West, beyond the global North, there are indigenous wisdoms of soulful human selves that we draw upon. And beyond that, there is a trans-species psychology emerging that can take key modern concepts like intelligence and thinking and expand and transform them to create a new non-separate relation to non-human animals and indeed to all living creatures with whom we share this planet. So by the end of my chapter, I've introduced the notion of compassion, literally feeling with beyond the gender binary, already in us this compassion, ineradicable, ineradicable from prenatal experience. I see this life force as essentially connective, a force of change at and beyond borderlines, and it's not in its nature to be held within the boundaries of the individual. It is everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And I think that gives a, a, a lovely introduction to your chapter, which I do recommend to everybody. I recommend all the chapters actually, but they're all a great read. And I found this one particularly illuminating. So I'd like to ask Chris now to talk about his chapter. Welcome, Chris. Uh, Chris, you're a psychotherapist and you've been a psychotherapist and trainer since 1978 and co-founded Revision, an integrative and transpersonal psychotherapy training, which going back for many years had an eco-psychology component well before its time, so to speak. And you were chair of the Climate Psychology Alliance before I was and you've published also in the field. So over to you, tell us about your chapter. Thank you, thank you, Wendy. Um, I'd like to start first by um, having a note of gratitude to my co-authors in this collaborative venture. It's um, quite unusual. And I can't say it was always easy, but it was always interesting and I learned a lot in the process. Um, probably my chapter got a lot more intelligible through the editing and commenting and maybe I'll come back to that because um, there are things that aren't intelligible 
and there's a bit of a conundrum there that we're trying to deal with a, a rite of passage, a, a cultural, an end to a civilization. Um, and yet we're using one of the chief tools of that civilization, the written word. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, and my way through in my chapter is to try and focus on the psychological processes, the unconscious processes. And I haven't really raised it, but sort of thinking about it again um, and relating to what Wendy was saying about the individual, how can there be an unconscious that's individual? It's a, a sort of misnomer there. Of course, the unconscious is collective. We might feel it personally. It might channel through us in the same way as lots of other things do. But the whole, um, you know, maybe we could even talk about a colonization of the unconscious. Um, and part of our work in trying to look at the unconscious is when we face into the the, um, the devastation that's going on, the derangements, um, is how can we bear it? How can we bear what feels unbearable? And although I haven't talked about it much in my chapter, I have written about it, including with Judith previously, a lot about uh, Jonathan Lear's book on radical hope. And one of the things that really struck me in there that still is with me, he says that the, um, the chief of the Crow Nation, Plenty Coup, said, when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground. The hearts of my people fell to the ground and they couldn't lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. And that nothing happening seems to me to reverberate fully into the emptiness. Um, and does speak to the subtitle, which is just as important as the main title of his book, which is Cultural Devastation. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're facing into. And one of the things I touch on is the bystander effect about um, when we're talking about the exploitation, the colonizing, the destroying of lands, crops, animals, people's culture. Um, it's easy to say, I can't imagine ever doing that. And it's much harder to say, I can imagine that. I can imagine being a participant in that. And therefore I recognize that I'm complicit. And this um, leads into, I think, one of the bits of practice, one of the psychotherapy, but maybe we could call it psych cultural psychotherapy work is the work on remorse, which isn't just being painful. It isn't just saying, <laughs> uh, ain't it awful? It's really feeling the complicity. And I think it leads into the work of disenchantment, the work of disentangling from our culture and the beginning of a potential repair. And once again, I think it's important that this repair work is not some sort of individual heroic effort. I'm going to repair everything that's ever happened. It's part of opening to a cooperative venture in which I'm feeling supported. Um, so um, one of the ways I touch on in, in the chapter is about um, different ways of communicating other than the written word. <laughs> um, and there's this book um, by Kuhn called um, how the, is it called How the Forest Thinks? I'm forgetting now. Um, 
uh, suddenly it's the whole notion of a forest thinks. And it might not be obvious what that means. It doesn't mean that trees communicate, though they do. It means the forest is already a community that thinks together and cooperates. And that often includes humans. And the, the tribe he worked with, the, um, the Runa, um, talk a lot about their communication with other than humans. And um, that that's not a rational discourse. They're relying on all sorts of signs that they've learned to be sensitive to. And one of the things I particularly um, enjoy was them talking about interpreting their dog's dreams. Now that's, that's a real wake up, interpreting your dog's dreams. Um, I thought about, unfortunately, my dog has died a few years ago, but when he did dream and we were witnessing it, he always seemed to be chasing things. And um, I thought initially, well, maybe that's trivial. And I thought, well, maybe it's not, because maybe it's a brilliant comment on humans who always seem to be chasing things um, uh, in modernity anyway. Um, so. Um, and I also have a, a, a little touch on my interaction with this dog. When at the end of a, quite a long walk, I was wanting to get back home and he wasn't agreeing to come. And I, at first I thought he just wanted to stay longer. And then I really looked and I saw that his body posture was one of alertness and like he might spring off in any direction. And I suddenly realized this is a play gambit. He wants me to play. And as soon as I got that, I opened up and we did in fact have a, a lovely little game. And after which, of course, he was quite happy to come home. But that is a little illustration of how our minds try and expect and determine and control what is happening rather than be present to what might be emerging. Um, and um, playing is so important. And when we're faced with matters of life, certainly if I speak for myself, faced with matters of life and death, I tend to get really serious. Um, and it's difficult to allow my creativity to come back and be playful. And one of the things that's um, helped me in the absence of um, my particular dog is, is other animals. Um, and of course, being lucky enough to have a garden. Um, and one of the things when we were working together as authors, we would sort of think about our person's chapter together. I was very struck, Paul was making comments about my chapter and he said it reminded him of a time when he was on a long walk with his dog sitting over a cliff and he noticed how his dog was just sensing the world over the cliff. And he recognized the dog was extending his senses well beyond what he could. And I think that that is a, a lovely illustration of, you know, our species does not have hegemony on our sensory apparatus in relation to how we see the world. It's quite specialized how we see the world and opening up to how others see the world is part of this, um, I would talk about is recovering kinship and moving away from the disenchantment of our own particular view of the world to being enchanted again. Um, and so I think play is a great antidote. And there's a couple of little bits, um, a sort of quotes that I think are quite helpful in this. Um, one is from a, a wonderful book title by one of my favorite authors from the past called Vaslavik. And this, um, the, the book was called, The Situation is Hopeless, but Not Serious. And I think that um, speaks a lot to today. And the other um, we used on the, um, the workshop and the conference on radical hope from Beckett, who said, you're on earth. There's no cure for that. Thank you so much, Chris. 
I'm going to turn now to Sally very quickly. Sally, can uh, Laurie switch Sally on? So welcome Sally to talk about your chapter. For those who don't know her, Sally has spent her professional life practicing as a psychoanalyst. And I'd like to highlight the two books, one that she co-edited and the second that she wrote that have so enriched the climate psychology discourse. And the first is Engaging with Climate Change, which was published 10 years ago now, Psychoanalytic and Interdisciplinary Perspectives. And it, it was a wonderful foundational book for our field. And then more recently, last year, um, Sally published Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, Neoliberal Exceptionalism, and the culture of uncare. And that reflects her preoccupation over this last decade, which came to fruition in this book. So over to you, Sally. Thank you. Um, I, it's very exciting, uh, this launch. I'm so pleased to be part of this book. Um, and also it's been very, very enriching working the four of us together uh, one thing that doesn't appear in the book is that we actually had conversations, Zoom conversations, where we discussed everybody's chapters and asked questions about them and learned about each other and um, found commonalities and also differences. It was a very rich um, exchange and I'm grateful for it. And I'd also like to uh, express gratitude to Wendy uh, because I don't think without your sort of chivying in the background, keeping us to task, Wendy, we'd have this book. Um, and we're all in your debt for that. And uh, thank you. Anyway, uh, I'm not going to attempt to, in any sense, summarize my chapter. I don't think it's possible, certainly not in a few minutes. But I was looking at the book again, um, and, and, and my chapter, and I came across just one sentence, which I'll mention in a minute that I will read out. Um, you know, it's been reference has been made to um, we're imagining the future. I think in my chapter, my chapter was a slightly different project. It was actually coming out of um, a real sense of frustration at the difficulty of living in the world as as I find it, as we find it. And thinking, you know, this is my only life. I, I want it different. And it was like a sort of an upsurge of, it felt like vitality in myself um, that wanted to express itself now, not in the future. And, and I recognized something had changed in me. And, uh, and having experienced that, um, I then uh, struggled with what does it mean to actually stay lively within a culture that in so many directions actually um, is anti-life? Uh, what I call the culture of uncare. You know, it, it drives us splitting, fracturing, othering, and so on, and it alienates us. So uh, what are the conditions that we need to, um, to really be able to uh, dance the dance of life um, now, I don't mean in the future, because you can only really, I think, also work for a future if you actually have a, some sense of what that will actually feels like. And to me, it felt, on the one hand, a whole lot better, and on the other hand, a tremendously difficult struggle. So um, I start my chapter by saying, uh, early in lockdown, I fell in love. And I think, and I say, I fell in love and I artificially divide it up into with myself, uh, with nature and with other people. And by myself, I mean the caring part of myself, which has a lot, you know, underneath it that hangs underneath that. And it's in, and, and then I was thinking about how, how do we find um, uh, the, the oomph, the force, the liveliness to, to, uh, to, to arrange it so that the caring, loving part of ourselves is actually dominant and not dominated by and sidelined by the uncaring part. How, how, how do we live, how do we uh, you know, enable conditions such that we 
live a life of care. Um, so that, so it was in relation to that that I found this sentence. It's only half, I'm only going to read half of it, where I say, to pay proper respect to this caring part means having to change in real, not in as if ways. In other words, we have to actually be able to live that life not just dream about it in the future, but live it now. So my chapter is an exploration of the difficulties of what it means to live a life uh, in, in current culture, as opposed to existing uh, as hollow people, as, as Chris put it, as, as Paul put it, you know, in, in other words, as Chris put it, um, you know, in, in Jonathan Lear's terms, uh, you know, uh, feeling on the ground? How do we actually stand up? And I want to end just by saying that um, I realized in revisiting uh, my own chapter today that it reminded me of something which is like, if you like, an intra-generational conversation. Because what it reminded me of is that when I was 10, um, I did a watercolored painting now I'm really no good at painting and you know, it's, it's a funny looking thing, but actually um, I thought that it really expressed something uh, of what has come out in my chapter. It's, it's a girl um, aged about 10 and she's in a blue dress and she's moving really freely and she's dancing. And to me, it, it's like uh, something in me that surfaced and tried to find expression in a medium that I'm not very good at, um, you know, uh, to express uh, love of life. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Sally. And I really appreciated you speaking to the process of constructing this book, because I think that's one of the uh, implicit joys of the book is seeing that um, coming out of a relationality and conversations between all of you. So now I'm going to turn without more further ado to our um, three respondents. And Rupert, I'm going to start with you. Now, dear respondents, I am going to hold you to time. We're slightly over, but you each have 10 minutes and I have, some uh, messages <laughs> that Laurie has urged me to <laughs> create. Um, so <clears throat> welcome Rupert Reed. You probably don't need much of an introduction, but Rupert is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia. He's an author, blogger, and climate environmental campaigner, and the author of over a dozen books until recently, you'll have known Rupert as a frequent spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion. So Rupert, what did you make of the book? What have you to say to it? Well, thanks, and uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Yeah, what have I got to say? I thought what I might do is um, take my cue from the end of the book for the benefit of uh, those who haven't read it, as well as those who have. So I'm just gonna uh, read out the, the start of the final paragraph of the book. We hope this book represents a, a particular ethic of engagement with climate change. Now here I'm going to make my one and only criticism, which is that I wish you all would uh, use the term climate change a little bit less. Uh, I think that uh, if Confucius was still with us, he would say this is a name that needs to be rectified. It's, uh, it's the climate crisis or its incipient climate breakdown. Climate change is altogether too reassuring. Uh, and expression. So that's my one criticism uh, out of the way. Here's the ethic. First, find the courage to face the difficult truths it presents to us. Second, stay with the trouble this creates for us. Third, engender frameworks of care that enable us to do this together. And I think these three things, are, it's so beautifully put and so important. So I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about these uh, ideas. So in terms of the first two, what these convey to me and what is in some of the chapters in the book is the absolute importance of not being repelled by the difficult emotions that arise when we deal with this kind of stuff. So let me say something about some of those uh, emotions. So fear, anxiety, eco-anxiety, 
this can feel to, pe to people, and I know this only too well from my own experience, like a really terrible thing. Um, I found myself in a state of severe climate anxiety, for example, and, and climate depression, actually, um, after COP26, which I was at. And of course, the thing to do is to not suppress it, but to explore it with others, which is what I did in the next few days after coming down with it, uh, and to allow it. Uh, and then the emotion can transmute. Ultimately, of course, it needs to transmute into action. It also re needs to reconnect with its root, which is love, because why do we fear? Why are we anxious? Uh, because we love ourselves, we love our loved ones, we love the natural world, uh, we love uh, our neighbour. It all comes back to love. It's the same with, uh, with grief, um, ecological grief. We feel that because we're grieving for or mourning uh, what we love. And it's the same with, uh, with anger. Uh, we're angry because what we love is, is at risk. It all has its roots in love. And, and for this reason... I beg to disagree with those who sometimes say, oh, you know, fear, it's, it's not really a, a good kind of positive emotion to come from, it's spiritually dangerous. Or people who say the same kind of thing about anger. I beg to differ. I don't think there actually are any negative emotions. I, what this book has helped me to understand even more clearly is that at root, it seems to me in a psycho-spiritual sense, all of these emotions that the climate crisis forces us to feel and to experience and to face if we're willing to are actually good. And I thought that that was especially beautifully expressed, if I may say so, in Sally's chapter, which she was just talking uh, about. For example, I was very struck by her remarks about falling in love with other people during COVID, which she talks about in relation to the early stages of the COVID crisis. For me, this was very strongly felt around the NHS clap, which uh, for those of you not in the UK, we had a, a quite long period in 2020 when people went onto their doorsteps every uh, week uh, at a certain time of the evening and, uh, and clapped together for the NHS. Uh, and the first evening this was supposed to happen, I went out onto my doorstep and I thought to myself, I don't think there are gonna be very many people here, at least not on my street. I didn't feel good about it. I didn't feel positive about it at all. And uh, I came out there and there were quite a lot of people up and down. We were all looking at each other and sort of smiling. And then we started clapping and tears came to my eyes. It was such a, a, a marvelous thing to actually be part of that communal expression of gratitude and of love. And of course, ultimately, this ties in with what we heard from one of the other authors in the book earlier, the eco-psychological sense of being connected and part of the planet itself. And, and that takes us to the, the third of those three parts of the ethic, engender frameworks of care that enable us to do this uh, together. The biggest together of all is being citizens of the, of the planet together. But I liked the way that in this book, I felt, and you've heard a little bit about this from, from the authors already, I felt the collaborative spirit of the book was itself a way of kind of modeling this togetherness, which is so absolutely vital in relation to what we are facing. And I must express to you um, a, a sense of some admiration that you managed to do this with four of you. Uh, I have uh, done quite a lot of collaborative authoring in my time, usually with one other person, sometimes with two other people. When I've done it with two other people, I found it pretty challenging, frankly. I'm not sure I've ever done it with three uh, other people. So, you know, very well done for managing to bring the uh, book to uh, completion without uh, uh, tearing each other's uh, hair or pens out or, or whatever. Uh, that, it seems to me, is a nice piece of modelling of what we're talking about and what we're trying to be about uh, here. And we've already heard also a little of how a number of the chapters, as well as modeling this, they actually discuss it explicitly in terms of discussing the limitations of our paradigm of individualism. 
And here I'd like to make a remark, which is really a sad reflection on our culture. And it's this, that I think our culture, it prides itself on being a culture which is individualistic and which is pro-freedom. Uh, and maybe it accepts that it's not great at some things, but it thinks it's really great at that. But of course, the tragic reality is it's actually really terrible at that as well. Um, our culture is actually primarily one of emulative mass conformism. So even the one thing that we see, sort of seem to have some right to think we're really good at, we're actually really terrible at. And one place where I've, I've recently got quite a nice, clear sense of this is in reading, as I bet some of the rest of you have been as well, David Graeber's magnificent final book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, where he talks quite a lot about the way in which various um, societies in the past, smaller indigenous societies, societies of foragers, etc., appear to have managed to have achieved, on the one hand, a great deal of egalitarianism, as is widely known, but also, on the other hand, a great deal of freedom, including the freedom to be eccentric, uh, etc. There is not necessarily, Graeber and, and Wengro try to show in this book, any conflict between those things. Our society is, is obviously the opposite of egalitarian, but I would also claim that it's pretty poor in terms of actually achieving freedom or any kind of genuine uh, individualism. Uh, yes, I am coming towards uh, the end because I'm coming towards the very end of the book, which is the final uh, sentence of this paragraph that I read the first few sentences of earlier which reads as follows. To find and retain our love for the world, our care, our compassion, is a crucial foundation for whatever actions follow. And again, I think that's, that's so important, and I hope you can see how it ties together the things that I've been trying to say in the last several minutes, building on the things in this very useful book, that it all does come down to love. And if we can find the spirit to allow difference from ourselves in all of this, that's a crucial part of what we need to do. That would be what it would be to create a culture which was actually a genuine culture of individual freedom, as well as a culture of egalitarianism and a culture which was eco-psychological. Now, um, I'm not very optimistic that we're going to succeed in doing this, uh, but we have to try. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say which the way in which this book helped me to understand how it might be possible for us to succeed is this. I was reminded of the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche saying, look, the thing which is so crucial when you really look at humanity and look at the awful mess we're getting ourselves into, et cetera, the thing which is so crucial is nevertheless not to feel nausea at ourselves. So if we come back to this always out of a spirit of love, and notice and check ourselves when we feel nausea um, at what we've done to each other and what we're doing to the planet, then I think we'll be on the right track. And I think this book may help us to do that. So I'm delighted to have endorsed it and to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rupert. It's good. And I'll be coming back to you later, perhaps with some quest more questions for the authors that you, you might have. So now I'd like to welcome Beo Akomalafe to be with us. Beo, you're most welcome. Um, Beo is a philosopher, writer, activist, professor of psychology, and executive director of the Emergence Network which has a wonderful question on the web, on its website. What if the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis? Bayo curates an earthwide project for the recalibration of our ability to respond to civilizational crisis, a project which is framed within a material feminist, post-humanist, post-activist ethos and inspired by Yoruba indigenous cosmologies. So what better person to respond to this book? Beo, over to you. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, I greet you all. I'm, it's uh, 11 p.m. and they're about here in India. So you must know that I love this. <laughs> Um, I'm really grateful, and I, as I hear and meet the authors as if for the first time, I've met Sally before, and we had a conversation, 
somewhere else. Um, but as I meet you all, I'm there's a sweeping sense of warmth in my heart. I feel this is hospitable. I feel welcome. I feel at home. I feel this is um, um, at the same time troubling. And I'll say this, I'll say why I think it's troubling. Um, I think about five years ago, I gave um, a talk somewhere in Sonoma County in California about how I was recovering from my whiteness, which is confusing to those who came to listen, given the obvious. Um, but it was my way of signaling that whiteness is more than just um, uh, the skin color. It's, it's a social, material, theological, post-humanist enlistment of bodies in, in hierarchies that is given to the project of creating and terraforming a planet that is adequate for the modern fetish of the individual. Um, and that somehow me and my people were enlisted in that notion, that Baldurian quest for transcendence, that invitation to leave our tentacular relationships with planet, with others, with ancestry, with trauma as an ecological force instead of an individual private phenomenon. And that our dreams, how we want, how we desire, how we think, how we perform relationships um, was increasingly an artifact of this white modernity. So it was my way of also critiquing the idea that whiteness can be reducible to white identified bodies or Euro descendants. But in a way I was deeply white. And then in, in the um, course of that, I started to share about an animism. And this is where Judith, that idea comes from, that the way we respond to crisis is often part of the crisis. In my attempts to dismantle whiteness, I might be reinforcing the damn thing. So <laughs> what do I do? Um, and this is where Deleuze comes in with becoming animal, that to think is to become monstrous, right? And I remember standing up, uh, I mean, speaking, uh, speaking about this, not just in Sonoma County, but where I was visiting professor at Middlebury College in Vermont. And I remember a student standing up and saying, deeply passionate um, question, said, but what you're suggesting means we have to let white people off the hook, right? Like, We've done so much to get here, to be recognized as individuals, to steal into the spectrum of the human, right? And now you're moving the goalpost and saying, let's become animals. How dare you? <laughs> so there was something deeply troubling um, about it. And anywhere I speak about post-humanisms, um, eco-criticisms or, um, the deeply indigenous cosmologies and stories of the Yoruba people about crossroads and bodies in their becoming animal or their becoming otherwise. There is usually a reluctance to enter into this field because it might suggest we have to give up our space, our hard won victories in this Titanic or on this ship that is wrecking and hollowing out. So I come with gratitude, um, at the same time acknowledging the tensions that are here, right? Yeah. I'm usually shy to speak about my work and for the sake of our conversation. My work is situated at the crossroads. My work is about chasing the trickster. You might've heard of him, her, it, it, him, her defies gender, categoricity, um, or identity. Issue is what the Yoruba people call him. Missionaries, Christian missionaries came to Nigeria and they made him the devil, right? which I think he would not reject because 
I was like, that's interesting. Let's see what being the devil means. But the issue is called the man of the crossroads in my culture. And it is there that I situate my work um, at the amniotic site of co-emergence, um, at the spaces of transatlantic encounters where the slave ship is still a gleaming and shimmering figure of modernity. The very conditions upon which the project of the individual um, was built and is still heavily subsidized by today. I often tell the story of how the slave ship did not really disappear, actually. It got to the shore and sporulated, spilt its guts and became the shore. So that in a sense, we are still on the slave ship. So it was a deeply wonderful surprise to read this book and to be invited to the honorific um, position of endorsing it. I'll just stick, I'm not able to perform. It's my 11 p.m. brain, mind you. Uh, I apologize. I'm not able to perform the excellent encyclopedic sweep that Rupert just did um, of the book, but I'm able to say a few things. Um, the, one of the things that you know jumps at me and invites me in is this humbling acknowledgement that we are in deep trouble. And, and, and the sense of trouble that I speak of is not the one that is available for entrepreneurial manipulation. It's the idea that we are in deep and uh, these waters we're swimming in, they exceed imagination. They exceed uh, uh, frameability. That we will need other resources to meet this moment. And so um, my sister from the uh, publishers was saying a while ago, speaking about the incapacity of, of our responsibility at this time. It seems we're unable to meet this moment. There's this pervasive sense that um, mind is still on its perch in its pure positionality away from the trouble and that we can look upon this situation as if in a clinical setting and analyze it and come up with a solution in the by and by, right? But there's a line in the book that I really like, that the life of the mind closely resembles, I'm paraphrasing, 11 p.m. mind, remember, that the life of the mind closely resembles the life of society. In a sense, climate psychology is not just a study of symptomatic effects of climate crisis. It is the impossibility of the self in its continuity as individuated or as the, the stuff or the fetish of modern cosmologies. It is the story that we have become alien, right? that we are indistinguishable from geology, from ancestry, from lichens, from reticulated webs of spiders, from stone, from rock, from trauma, and from bodies buried in the swimming conditions of the transatlantic uh, <laughs> ocean. Um, yes, one minute. And so my, my offering then is not just a congratulations um, to the authors of this book, but a blessing to everyone who's going to pick up this beautiful prophetic um, encounter, beautiful collaboration. Um, it is mostly the invitation to notice, I feel for me that we can no longer look squarely on the problem, that we have to kind of perform some embarkation again. I, I usually think that um, the slave ship to, that came to Africa um, took black bodies across the Atlantic. The slave ship that is pulling towards the shore of modern civilization would be a different kind of embarkation altogether, an invitation to post-humanist becomings. So we're being invited, I feel, to an animism of the peripheral, not looking squarely at 
what is forward, so, so to speak, but to the awkward, to that which supposedly is by the sides, the ecstasy of things. I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase going through my head about looking slant at things, and um, I hope somebody will come up with the, Emily Dickinson. the quote. Thank you, Emily Dickinson. Yeah. Thank you. And now to Rebecca Weston, our final respondent. Rebecca is a very welcome colleague, part of the Climate Psychology Alliance in North America. Rebecca is a practicing full-time clinician whose area of expertise has included sexual trauma and attachment. And she's also been a lifelong activist and she brings those together. In her personal world, one of the ways she most cherishes life on this planet is through photography, which teaches her to accept things as they are and to see both light and shadow. And beyond all else, dear Rebecca, you're motivated by connection to your children and the future that you want them to have on this planet. Rebecca. So I just wanna say thank you um, for inviting me and thank you um, for, for everything that's already been said. It's been so interesting and inspiring and I am just so delighted to be part of this and, and so honored. And, so eager to actually get the book in hand and not have just the paper. Um, I love having the text of the book. And so congratulations to all of you um, for such an extraordinary gift to the world. Um, and I know that we don't have tons of time, so I'm just gonna go on, but I, I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the discussion as well. And, and just really, thank you. Um, so in, in, in talking uh, with Judith earlier, uh, she casually said that this book isn't really for activists. And that got my mind racing in many ways, all arising out of my belief that in this ominous period of climate collapse, anti-science hucksterism and fascist trends, we need to question the established rules of our profession and more frequently collaborate with those outside of it, expanding the reach and utility of our psychological insight to those working in other spaces. At the risk of sounding crudely mechanical, I believe there is no more urgent task facing humanity than to build a planetary-wide social, cultural, political, spiritual, and economic movement for climate justice, reparations, and sustainability. Indeed, as Martin Luther King once wrote, we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. And given that Paul Hoggett refers both to revolution in our minds and to the writings of an imprisoned Italian revolutionary Antonio Gramsci, I suspect I'm not alone in that thinking. So launched by Judith and stimulated by Paul and Sally Weintraub's comments in particular for today, I'll share some thoughts about the intersection between psychology and activism, between theory and practice, between individual and collective transformation. In company with Robert J. Lifton, who speaks of witnessing professionals, I think we must contend with the ideological constraints of our profession and the transformative limitations contained within the therapeutic space. With my trauma and attachment informed colleagues, I recognize the ways in which therapeutic interpersonal attunement and the reflective function help to contain, to not act out hard feelings destructively or maniacally. They are crucial for resilience, tolerance, and empathy, all things desperately needed in these treacherous and polarizing times. But to achieve the level of psychological transformation required to build a just and sustainable future, we also need agency. Too often our profession hides behind the analytic stance that sees action as the juvenile, reactive child in relation to the more adult reflective function. And not only does the stance collude with the fantasy that others will do the messy work of demanding change, but I simply do not believe 
that our alienated psyches can adapt in healthy ways to what's coming without the transformative process of active and collective engagement. Finally, I believe that in popular Western cultural, political, and activist discourse about climate change, we are both sorely lacking and sorely needing psychological insight. Well beyond the walls of the privatized analytic encounter, Paul and Sally's psychological insights can help us accomplish three exceedingly difficult tasks. First, to break through business as usual silence. Second, to authentically forge links between movements for racial and environmental justice on the one hand and climate justice on the other. And third, to build a movement based on love as we've all been saying, and on Sally's collective quote, force of a drowning person's strong push upwards to find air. For example, Paul's insight into the myriad forms of soft denial helps make sense of something deeply confusing and disturbing to those who tirelessly work to engage those around them on issues of climate change. Why won't people just look up? Why won't they just listen to the science? The story, as Paul helps us understand, is complicated. A new poll of adults released by Politico in the morning consult indicates that the majorities of all 13 countries surveyed are very concerned or somewhat concerned about climate, which even includes majorities of right-leaning voters. This is true even in the United States, a country hardly known for its forward thinking on climate. In other words, the majority of us are, at least some of the time, in touch with meaning and in touch with our caring selves. The problem, at least in the United States, is that despite such distress, the majority of people never talk about it. And so it's tempting to make the error Rene Lertzman warns us about. We make mistakes silence for apathy. We become shrill as we beat the drum of science, shame through purest individualist consumption co codes, and retreat into righteous despair after a day of exhausted overextension and hypervigilant doom scrolling. People are such idiots, we think. Humanity sucks. And burdened by this perspective, we make it harder to hear, harder to be heard, and even harder for people to break their own silence. And yet, as Catherine Hayhoe reminds us in the United States, it is precisely that silence that is the most dangerous. As mental health workers, we know that in silence, distress goes unsupported or unacknowledged. It gets sequestered from human connection. It is left dangling and isolated. In anxious and shamed silence, all manner of defensive strategies and vulnerabilities kick in. People more easily succumb to Paul's list of soft denial strategies, disavowal, diffusion of responsibility, suspension of curiosity, distancing and wishful thinking. In silence, people are more easily seduced by the lies of Paul Cynic, the nihilistic emptiness of his woke misanthrope, the merchants of doubt, and the false flag solutions of the fascists, ready to scapegoat and sacrifice the frontline victims of climate change. But if our fellow climate workers saw the majority not as apathetic, but instead as overwhelmed, conflicted, and intolerably afraid, our modes of engagement would change. Our discourse would shift, and our ways of reaching towards and communicating with others could include more compassion and less guilt, more imagination and less fact, more heart and less lecture. For the silent but caring majority, the majority that needs to speak, I believe this approach could be more generative and transformative. Just as Paul's insight helps make sense of the stubborn silence many observe in the face of catastrophe, Sally's explorations regarding the ecological self help us understand another deeply problem aspect of our movement, at least in the United States, the persistent and racialized split or tension between those who frame things in terms of climate and those who frame things in terms of environmental justice. 
very broadly speaking, at least in the United States, the stereotype is that climate folks are mostly white, middle class, and experience anxiety focused on future devastation. This stereotype is reflected in recent eco-anxiety media coverage and is mirrored in the membership and audience of our own organization. And I don't think we're unique. On the other hand, environmental justice activists are perceived as predominantly people of color, identified with the urban working class and focused on already existing trauma and devastation. Stereotypes, though these may be, they hold some truth. Though many work, are working very, very hard at every level to forge links, it nevertheless remains a split that hurts us all. Adding to the various economic, social, and political sources of this split that are beyond the scope of this, these comments, Sally's observations about idealized nature and disappeared violence offer a very important psychological perspective. Specifically named as climate anxiety, the bubble of psychic safety is indeed bursting as news and images from more extreme weather events are starting to break through popular consciousness. New layers of people are beginning to speak. And if we can support that anxiety in ways that encourage thoughtful, sustained and collaborative action, I think that breakthrough is a very, very good thing. But even as this bubble is bursting, another conversation is also taking place. It's about time, ah, now that white people are anxious, or yeah, but anxiety sure as hell isn't the same as trauma. Exploring the ways in which our own assumptions about nature and environment were embedded in her own geographic experience as a white middle-class woman, Sally recognized not only had she idealized nature, but the neoliberal culture depended precisely on the split between nature and urban environmental degradation. As Sally wrote, I cannot now not know that this nature haven is underpinned by money, privilege, and strife. In the context of climate change, to the extent that nature is psychologically equated with outside of and an escape from the lived urban environment, the natural devastation wrought by the extreme weather events of climate change do feel new and do feel newly urgent. However, for those living in the very sacrifice zones upon which the extractive and fossil fuel industry depend, the devastation is anything but new, anything but anticipatory, though it has not always been framed in terms of climate, but instead in terms of health, housing, clean air, and toxic water. But in truth, as many of us know, these two realities are deeply intertwined. As Hop Hopkins wrote for the Sierra Club, a popular and older environmental US-based organization, you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones, and you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people, and you can't have disposable people without racism. And I would take these splits one step further, because of course in a world that relies on such splits, there is also a hierarchy of desirability, value, and power. I would suggest that to the same extent that the slow violence of urban environmental de degradation, heat islands, and sacrifice zones are devalued and disappeared, so too by association are the people for whom such areas are home, where they live, love, work, and raise children, blighted. And here I would once again suggest that to address these splits, they need to be named. They need to be acknowledged. Far more consequential than any individual act of consumer consciousness, talking honestly about these dynamics is yet another way to break down dysfunctional defenses, build resilience, and open space for authentic collaboration. And finally, I conclude with Sally and Paul and with Wendy and with Chris, in love, in wonderment, and in relationship. Though it's crucial that we wrestle with our relative degrees of privilege and how they impact our everyday choices and our experiences of climate, it is equally vital that we embrace our passions, our connections to each other, and our lived environment. 
where guilt can become paralyzing and preoccupied. An embodied yearning for a future generates capacity over the long haul. In societies such as mine right now, that are trying to ban histories of mass movements and human struggle, questions of individual action often get reduced to our role as consumers. But far beyond our ability to carefully curate purchases, we are social beings. We live in relationship with others, others who also have the capacity to care, to share ideas, and create new possibilities. Grounding our action in relationship, both inside and outside the consulting room, may we all go forth in the manner of Paul's revolutionary, Antonio Gramsci, with the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. Thank you, Rebecca. You had to breathe once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. I'd like to ask, um, ask our authors just to say one or two sentences. And I literally mean that. Uh, Paul, um, do you have a response to, to the respondents? What, what has touched you? Or maybe somebody else would like to go first, one of the other authors. <laughs> Chris. I could jump in. I think this, this word that's came up at the end of the book that Rupert mentioned, <clears throat> engendering, is a really interesting word. It's not very much used, and therefore it's still got, what can I say, creative capacity in it. And I think it combines the heart with agency. And it, um, I, I won't actually try and distribute all its meanings, but I think it's intrinsically a very interesting and potent word that brings together a lot of things that we didn't fill out. It sort of coagulated at the end there. Um, and it may be, maybe there could be a whole workshop on engendering. Mm. Thank you, Chris. Any other responses from the authors as you listened to the impact your book had had on Rupert, Bear and Rebecca? I'm, I'm taking in, um, sorry, I'm taking in, Bear, you said, you said this word, you said responsibility and uh, it's going to take me a long time to digest that, but I think it's very powerful. You didn't say responsibility, you said responsibility, and um, that's really preoccupying me because I think it's um, it's very interesting. Because how do we find the ability? What what's needed to find the ability to respond? Um, and it's links with responsibility. So, I, I mean, that's just one thing that's challenged me and has got me thinking. But thank you ever so much, everybody, for, um, for all the things you've said about this book. I'd like to quickly credit that to Karen Barad, author of Meeting the Universe Halfway, for that hyphenated wonder of a word, responsibility. Thank you. I'm still in the process of digestion. Um, such a lot was added <laughs> um, to expand and um, give focus to um, the book and its surrounds that I'm not quite sure yet that I can pick something out. So I'll pass. Thank you, both, all three of you, though. Um, there's a lot to think about. Do you have any thoughts? Um, I just like that phrase that really emerged out of the contributions from our respondents, which is um, looking slant, because I think that's what we need to be able to do more if we're to get out of this kind of um, prism of modernity that we're stuck in, in terms of how we think about ourselves and life. Mm. Can I add one tiny thing on that, which I gestured at in the chat, which is that for my money, 
the person who's the best of all at helping with this task is Ian McGilchrist. Uh, and uh, I bet a number of people here are aware of his work. Um, I've just finished reading uh, his, his new book, all 1600 pages of it. And uh, it's uh, a, a brilliant deep dive into what's just been mentioned really. Might I quickly add that uh, um, I think another great person to turn to would be my son, who is on the spectrum and who is inspiring me to look slant in avoiding my gaze. He performs a kind of right to opacity, will not be captured by my naming. And so he looks away at, I call it. And I think that is that autistic response is the post activism of our times. I, I don't know whether you'd include your son in that, but the way you, um, Bay, you pronounce peripheral, I don't know if that was intentional, it had a hyphen in the middle, the peripheral. I think that's another, these hyphens, that like the eco-psychosocial and others, I, I think that they're, they're offering a lot to the language. And peripheral, wow, I'm definitely going to take that away in my wild clinic. Yeah, so it seems as if we're breaking down our words somehow, but um, not in a superficial um, nitpicking way, but in a way to allow them to speak perhaps more deeply. Um, I wanted to ask our respondents this perhaps is too big a question, but um, perhaps I'll start with you, R Rupert. From your, your position within the climate and environmental movement, and um, how do you see the best way that those of us in climate psychology can play our part? What do you, what do you need from us? Hmm. Well, I guess there's a few things. One is the is the sort of semi-practical thing of uh, of actually uh, offering uh, uh, therapy to the uh, larger and larger number of people uh, who are going to need it tragically uh, over the, the the coming generation. Um, in terms of sort of thought leadership or whatever, for me, the the heart of it is around what I try to say succinctly in my remarks, really. Um, helping people to understand that the so-called negative emotions are not to be suppressed or uh, feared, but to be uh, embraced, uh, stayed with, uh, harvested, uh, uh, transmuted, uh, and recognized as, uh, as roundabout forms of, uh, of love. Uh, this, to me, is absolutely critical. Uh, and really would be a, a, a sort of cultural revolution if it was achieved, because although that kind of idea probably makes intuitive sense to a lot of people who are here on this call today, I think in our, in our wider culture, it's still a completely non-existent or mysterious or terrifying itself uh, idea. Um, so I think there's a huge job of work to be done there. And uh, if, if that can be done and, and tied into the, the worsening climate and ecological crisis, that will be uh, uh, a magnificent achievement by, uh, by psychologists. Mm, thank you. I'm reminded of our colleague Caroline Hickman, who in, in her yeah. lectures uh, talks about, we, we, we need to sit on all the seats on the bus of all the different feelings but there's a problem if we just get stuck on one seat, the yeah. anger seat or the, the grief street seat. Um, Rebecca. You're, you're muted. muted. Always leaning towards the concrete, I'm thinking about the criminalization of protest. And I'm thinking about the way the policing um, happens, um, certainly in the United States um, and the use of tactics against um, mostly black people in the cities are now using, being used also in tactics against people who are protesting fossil 
um, fossil fuels and how that is going to be a source of righteous anger. <laughs> um, and I believe it's important anger. And I also agree very much with what Rupert says is that that anger is coming out of a place of deep connection and deep love and um, rage that this is being taken away from people, a whole way of imagining a future and a way of connecting to their past. And I find it um, absolutely critical that we which is again why I absolutely believe it's important that we use the psychological insight we have and take it outside of our own psychological realms, outside of the individual consulting rooms, and that we really do engage in other spaces, whether it's around making movies, there's a lot about Don't Look Up that's come up that's generated a lot of questions about sort of the use of social science and everything else that I think it's a critical, critical role for psychologists to play in addition to working in our individual capacities with individual clients. Mm. Thank you, Rebecca. We're opening the chat again for any, um, any comments as we begin to close this meeting. Um, and uh, forgive me, I, I didn't uh, give the heads up earlier on that we were going to close the chat for some of the time uh, because there were so many people here. Uh, but do please post any comments and shares about uh, what's touched you. Um, and we are hoping to have more events based on the book that will be more, allow uh, more audience interaction. Bayo, can I ask you that question of your 11 o'clock or now your 11.30 mind, which is, is what do you see uh, as the need uh, that climate psychology needs to address um, as, as we go on beyond this book. I'm often um, known for saying this. My, uh, my wife rolls her eyes every time I say this. It's, I say it too much in the house, but um, I will say it here. The times are urgent, let us slow down. The times are urgent, let us slow down. Um, I can hear the questions of William Reich, 1933, burning through my head right now, that why do people fight for servitude, right? Um, as stubbornly as they would fight for salvation. Um, and I think this is where we start to look at the intersections of psycho uh, psychology and politics or schizoanalysis and just notice that we are at a we are at a crossroads event where psychology cannot continue um, in that forward moving trajectory. And we need new ethnographies, um, new cartographical projects that take us away from the plantation. And so slowing down is not a function of speed, slowing down is a function of sitting with the trouble, Haraway, or congregating around cracks, around sites of failure, congregating around the places where continuity is challenged by topographical shifts. It's about learning to listen to the world as if it were a colleague, not just a tool or a resource or something to be instrumentalized. It's learning to um, meet each other. I, I, I'm not of the opinion that compassion is the moral essence of this, or that love, like my brother would say, is, is where all of this arrives at. I feel, like you said earlier, Rupert, that there are no negative emotions. I think I want to echo that and champion that and shout it out on rooftops, that those things that we tend to pathologize and, and name as evil or villainous are potentially allies, you know, on this journey of becoming. And so I would say it again, the times are urgent, let us slow down. We need to find our odd kin, the others with which we can perform this journey because we cannot do it ourselves. Thank you, thank you. And perhaps we're talking about the biodiversity of our emotions as well. Well, we could go on, my dears, we could go on. Thank you so much. And especially for those who it's very late at night. And um, 
I'm most grateful, Rupert and Beo and Rebecca, for your responses. And I, I'm picking up from the chat that everybody else was nourished as well. There's so much coming through. And such um, it's been such an honor to chair this event um, and to try and hold together some conversation. And I want to thank Paul and Wendy and Sally and Chris, it's the order I can see you on the screen, um, for their work and their passion and actually the love they have put for this discipline and this, this slow emergency that we're all facing. Uh, that has brought this book uh, to fruition, that has engendered this book. So thank you all very much. We will write to all of you who have signed up uh, with any future events based on this book. Um, and we'll now end this webinar. Um, and let us all work hard but also slowly and mindfully and present to all that we are. Thank you. And we'll be leaving the chat open just for five more minutes for people to put in what they wish. <clears throat> so.